the first assassination attempt and you mm-hmm. made a pretty explicit claim that there was going to be more and after the second assassination attempt i hit you up i was like all right we have to talk about this this is a narrative that they're setting up here because they want to kill trump but they want to blame somebody else for it and then of course they get the two for them being able to say well, iran killed trump so we have to go to war with iran to listen to jamie diamond speak he's like we need to let trump come back to power and the hell with ukraine everything that happened between world wars one and two relative to currencies and debt and everything else were all designed to get the desperation here is all on the part of the people who have the most to lose by Trump returning to power. And that would be Europe and the British. And as always, it's always the same people over and over again. They need a war to cover the fact that they're defaulting. So with all of this and the coup story and the this, that, and everything else, if you string all of those pieces together, did Joe Biden make a deal with Trump? This rip of TFTC was brought to you by River. It's the best place to buy Bitcoin. Go to river.com slash TFTC and enjoy this episode. I can't wait until the day that we do this in person because we don't have to worry about Mm. these technical difficulties. (laughs) Yeah, that would be fun. So one of these days, if you're ever in Florida or or I get up in your area of of the planet, we will. And, you know, it'll be be fun. Do you make it to Texas often? Texas? God, no. Um... Last time I was in Texas was for the Ron Paul conference when I did the the speech out there. Um, and then before that, it was like to go to on a cruise like 15 years before. So, I mean, I drove through Texas actually once since then. So I just know I don't, I, I never leave the house, Marty. They don't let me out of the house. Like I'm not fit for human consumption. Come on. I'm the <laughs> first time I came to Texas was three months before I moved here. Um, mm-hmm. I was uh, bunkered up in the Northeast most of my life. You're saying. Before we had technical difficulties, drinking tonight, 7 p.m., 7.10 now, central right. time, 8.10, East Coast, you got a storm headed your way. Mm-hmm. Hurricane season still. Actually, this is yeah, probably like. A, this is late, I think, in the season. I think this the, the hurricane season technically goes until November. My my partner, Dexter White, knows this stuff far better than I do. Just, like, he lives in a far worse um, far higher risk zone in Florida than I do. I actually live in like the one part of Florida that never gets directly hit. Uh, so it's really kind of awesome. <laughs> we get prepped for the hurricane. We do the thing. Blah, blah, blah. We lose power because we're because because of where we live, right? Because we're just the first ones to we're the last first ones to lose power and the last ones to get it back because we're at the end of the the grid, right? The grid mm-hmm. literally stops at my house, and so you know if there's any surge whatsoever, we get we lose my my neighborhood and we we'll lose power. Even if it's just a, you know, just a surge that blows the breaker on the substation at the head of the, you know, but then it takes four or five days for somebody to come out and check the breaker because we're the lowest population density in the area. So we're the ones that get service last. It's just the way it always works out. So low man on the totem pole. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Happens. I got stuck in New York City during uh, Sandy. That was fun. Visiting my, my now wife. At the time, girlfriend from Chicago. Right. Well, first I mean, time, I, all, first time I went to visit her too, and I got stuck in her apartment was for four special. extra days. Yeah. Hmm. Well, you know, I hope you made the best of it. Yeah, it turned out well. I'm married, two children now. Uh, <laughs> okay. Well, then, I, I guess I guess you know, like adversity brings people together. It's a good thing if you had because you had to be stuck in New York without power. Oh, God, I, like that sounds like hell to me. Right. Having done, having lived adjacent to New York City, my, you know, when I was growing up, like the idea of being without power in New York City for four days is just, uh, just anathema. Well, we were, I mean, Lord of the Flies figuring out what happens when the world goes to shit. We were on the Upper East Side. So we were, or she was at the time. So we were the, uh, the apartment that everybody was flocking to to charge their phones. Um, (laughs) And, uh, <laughs> you know wow yeah no I, I and that's what i'm that's what i'm thinking like that's part of the reason why i don't live anywhere where i, I mean I, again I, I live in the middle of kind of nowhere kind of not too far from anywhere right i'm only like a couple only like five minutes away from like you know, the, the, the the grocery store but the way i the way it works out because i'm just over the county line like the i'm in the weird services dead zone right and um and it just happens to be that, you know, once you leave the town that I live north of, 
there's nothing there for another 25 miles, right? It's like, it's, it's Florida. Um, there's cities and then there's a couple of feeder towns and then there's nothing. And then there's the next city. And, then, <laughs> and that's just the way it is. Um, and then especially North Florida is dotted that way. So, um, you know, it has its advantages and disadvantages. The advantage is, well, you know, if you ride out power for four days, it's not going to be over to the flies. And you're not going to have to worry about, you know, people randomly wanting to steal your shit. And on the other hand, um, the the wind blows and the power goes out for four days. Yeah. So. Sounds a lot like Texas, actually. Yeah. Um, so. Speaking of hurricanes, I mean, that's a, the reason I brought you on is leading because I hit you up because mm-hmm. I don't know if you recall, but in July when we recorded, it was right after right. the first assassination attempt and you mm-hmm. made a pretty explicit claim that there was going to be more. And after the second assassination attempt, I hit you up. I was like, all right, we have to talk about this. There's a hurricane <laughs> brewing, if you will. Right. Right. Uh, allow me to, to analogize here uh, sure. to the election. It's, it's all very weird now because the second assassination attempt, obviously on the golf course, guy seems mm-hmm. like a kook, seems like the government was very well aware of him. Yeah, what's what's going thing, on in your mind? I, I, I always defaulted that these people are straight out of central casting and, you know, and I, I can't get away from that. I'm not, and I'm not saying that I know that for, for certain, this guy looks like a true believer that they probably radicalized and all the rest of it. That's fine. But, you know, there's, there's too much smoke here. And the fact that the, um, the justice department is blocking the state of Florida from doing an investigation into this is a telltale sign that there's something to hide. I mean, why would they, why would they hide? You know, if this guy was just a random crazy, well then just let it go to discovery and let this guy go to jail and, you know, let the state do their job. No, the feds want to step in. And, you know, take the investigation over and whitewash it and throw it under the rug. Like this clearly some there's clearly smoke here. And I thought it was a cool thing on DeSantis's part, Governor DeSantis's part to uh to, to force that issue into the open. That's what he's supposed to do. Um so and that's his dog whistle of saying, look, this is a state issue. I mean, this is a state crime, you know. I'm sorry. It's just it just is. It's attempted murder and you know, that's our job. You predicted this. Many people predicted this leading up to the election. Things are going to get mm-hmm. extremely chaotic, more mm-hmm. chaotic by the day they have today. Apparently, there was a third assassination attempt. Uh, Iran is <laughs> has them in the crosshairs, and then you have all these things going on in parallel. Israel creeping into Lebanon. Right. Uh, Zelensky coming to Pennsylvania, nobly campaigning for Kamala Harris, <sighs> and I'm at the point where I'm completely confused because I'm like, what? What is going on here? Because the Iran thing doesn't make like what do they have to gain here? They they don't have anything to gain. So this is a pure kind of psyop thing. Like I'm sorry, I just don't buy it. Like when Mark Levin is out there kind of screaming, oh, "Iran's trying to kill Trump!" Like oh please, like Mr. Neocon himself is out there screaming for war on. What a shock! Um, no, this is a narrative that they're setting up here. Um, because they want to kill Trump, but they want to blame somebody else for it. And then, of course, they get the twofer of them being able to say, well, Iran killed Trump, so we have to go to war with Iran, blah, blah, blah. Like, they're desperate. The desperation here is all on the part of the people who um, have the most to lose by these by Trump returning to power. Um, and uh, that would be Europe and the British. And as always, it's always the same people over and over again. They need a war to cover the fact that they're defaulting. They want to default. They need to default. They're going to default. There's nothing they can do to stop it. Even with Powell cutting interest rates by 50 basis points the other day, the markets have sold off in a way that they 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 shouldn't have with that kind of. uh, with that kind of result. And if we're having uh, like connection issues, it's, you know, we have a Starlink. hurricane coming through and I'm on Starlink. So, yeah. yeah, I'm, I'm on, I'm at, you know, I can see myself like my feed is terrible. So I can only imagine what you guys are seeing. Um, and I, you know, I apologize, but there's nothing I can do about it. Um, you know, I'll just call up the God and tell them to, to, to hold the hurricane off for an, an hour and then we can go on with the, go on with the world. Right. So, um, but that's, 
you know, that's just, that's a cover story. Okay. You've got, you know, Bond or Leyen and Starmer putting out photo ops um, at, on the sidelines of the UN. They're, they're, they're desperate to try and force the United States into this, co- these conflicts. And the Pentagon has clearly made it a, that they're not interested in fighting a war with either Russia and barely are, are even willing to fight, to, to show up and fight for the Israelis here. So there's something else going on. The State Department wants this. The Ukrainians and the State Department, the Blinkens and the Newlands and the Kagans and all those people, they, the Vindmans, they all want this. The, the British need this because they've guaranteed all this debt and they've, guaranteed, they've made guarantees to everybody about how they were going to carve up Ukraine after they destroyed Russia and then force the Russians to pay reparations and everybody you know, attendant to that group that fomented all this. Uh, we're going to get paid. So that's the Black Rocks and everybody else. I mean, and by the way, J.P. Morgan is involved in that as well. And yet to listen to Jamie Dimon speak, he's like, we need to let Trump come back to power and the hell with Ukraine. So like, you know, what's going on there, right? Yeah. And has yeah. there been posturing within the State Department and Blinken get put on the sidelines as mm-hmm. well? I read that last week. Yeah. Well, what happened, I think, was, yeah, there's a lot, I mean, there's a lot to unpack, cause, and I haven't, I mean, I'll be honest with you, Marty, like, part of me is like, it's all going to be fake and gay until the election, so I'm just waiting for the election to be over and done with. But, you know, last week, the, the two things that happened, and, and when I get to that point sometimes, I, I realize that all I have to do is wait for the, like, the two really discordant pieces of information to happen, and then... Everything else doesn't matter. Everything else is kind of downstream of those two events. And the first event was when uh, Secretary of State Lloyd Austin, or Secretary of Defense, sorry, Lloyd Austin, met with Zelensky in Mannheim in Germany and told him flat out, "You're not getting any more missiles, and you're not getting what you're not getting uh, our permission and our support, logistical support, to strike targets deep in Russia. We're not doing this." And then the next day, Blinken and David Lammy, the UK Foreign Secretary, are in Kiev telling. Zelensky, oh no, you have our permission to do all these terrible things. And then they blow, and then right after that, they blow up a, a, a massive ammo dump in, in Russia. And the Brits then almost pretty much take, take credit for the whole thing. And I'm like, there you go. Everything else is downstream of this. And in the context of the stuff that I've, I've the content that I've put out with my friend Alex Craner. Uh, both in podcasts we've done together and then he was on my podcast and the stuff that he's put out on his sub stack. And if anybody hasn't read that work or listened to those podcasts, I absolutely urge you to do so. Not for me, but for Alex, because Alex is fucking killing it. Uh, and he pretty much figured out that Ukraine is in default on the original tranches of debt that were issued through the IMF to them, which the British guaranteed. This is the TLDRs that the British guaranteed a whole bunch of debt through the IMF, and now Ukraine is in default. And that they were given a two-year grace period, which ended on August 1st. And in the lead up to August 1st, Zelensky goes and addresses Parliament. He addresses the he addresses the uh, the cabinet, the British cabinet, which a foreign leader hasn't addressed the British cabinet directly in like 60 years. So this is existential um, to the British at this point. So they need somebody to come in here and try and f- make this war happen. And it's analogous to what they did in World War I, in the lead up to World War I. Let me, give me just two minutes to explain this, and then I think it'll, it'll, it'll all make kind of sense here. In, in World War I, the, the British borrowed a fucking ton of money from the Americans, right, in order to fight the, German, the Germans. The French did the same thing. So the reason why Woodrow Wilson, I got that right for the first time. I always get him and Hoover mixed up. But Woodrow Wilson was so gung-ho into getting us involved in World War I was because we had, um, we had a whole lot of debt that would have gone bad, right, uh, in the United States, in the American banking system, American uh, investor classes, if Britain and France couldn't um, close, seal the deal. And so Versailles is as much a punishment system in order to ensure that 
the British paid the Americans back. And then there's some stuff about the Dawes bonds after the German hyperinflation and everything else. But everything that happened between World Wars I and II relative to currencies and debt and everything else were all designed to get to extract the wealth out of Germany to pay reparations particularly in perpetuity to Britain and back to the United States. So the British put themselves in a vulnerable position. And and Hoover, uh, sorry, Wilson, uh, I, can't, I, can't, I cannot get these two straight. Um, <laughs> I, I always do this. It's so funny and because they're both terrible. I, and, um, uh, and, and Wilson goes, it, it needs to go into World War One. And aside from the fact that he was a, effectively a British agent anyway, he was elect, he was brought to power in order to, you know, repair in order to bind the United States and Britain together in an alliance, which had knew previously they were our, our greatest enemy, right? For 140 years. So um, this was the the big twist. We get the Federal Reserve, we get the recollection of senators, we get World War One. All that stuff happened during the 19 teens that fundamentally changed America completely. And one could argue that that would be the third American revolution. The first one we won, the second one was the war between the states and the third one was you know like december 1913 when we got the 16th amendment the 17th amendment and the federal reserve act um so he put all that together and the same situation is playing itself out now the bank of england is in a serious threat of default <laughs> effectively bankruptcy um and because of Ukraine war debt and some other things, like, and then there's the, the 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 guilt crisis of 2022 that Alex tied into all this, which is also fascinating, like brilliant work on his part. When you realize that they need this, they need the United States to come in and bail them out again, militarily, in order to bail them out, monetarily, and so that's where this stands. And the now is that we have a Pentagon that is uninterested in doing this. And even this is even with guys like Austin who are not what I would call the greatest of American patriots or anything. Like, I don't, I don't see Lloyd Austin as, you know, any great, you know, figure here. But, you know, when you look around, you see the the shape the Navy's actually in and not just the the thing about the, uh, the, the, the carrier group, you know, losing its, its oil, uh, its oil, uh, it's refueling ship. Then then having to like, you know, scramble to try and get everything refueled. That's just one part of it. Like there's been a lot, this is a, 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 a regular, this is a, a big subplot, which is that the Navy is unprepared to fight a real war. And so why are the British, our greatest allies trying to get us involved in two major wars, one land war in Asia and the other one, basically a naval support war in the Middle East. If we're not capable of fighting either of these things, um, it's got to be because they want to, they want to destroy us. They want to. They, 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 this is a, this is the classic moment of, like, destroy yourselves in an orgy of violence, and whatever capital is in the United States, they'll, you know, they're they're ready to pull the plug on us, liquidate us, and move all their, move all the capital back to the insouciant wise and internal European Union, which is of course the the point here, or back to the City of London. And then let them fight it out as to who's going to run the world later on. And I still believe that City of London is trying to um, to fight uh, fight Brussels on this. And Brussels, of course, is winning. By the way, so you know, I don't know. That's what I see. It's a very and and again, I, I'm I'm I could be wrong about all this, but I don't know that the the thing between Austin and Blinken the very next day, and then there was the, the I don't know if you saw Larry this thing with the video with Larry Wilkerson and Judge Napolitano, uh, and Wilkerson's not the only one who's put this story out there, which is that the Pentagon went to the White House and told Joe Biden there will not be a war for Israel in the Middle East. We will not fight this war. We're not going to fight in Ukraine. We're not doing any of this, and you're going to stand down, and that. If you, there was the article, I think, on Zero Hedges, was there a coup in America? With Was there a military coup in America? Yeah. And I know that it's true, but, you know, it's certainly something for us to consider. And it's funny you mentioned, so it's funny ahead. you mentioned that because right before you hopped on, I saw a tweet from an hour ago that mm -hmm. the 
State Department announced that they're not going to be sending intel to Israel and Lebanon, um, mm -hmm. which would be a de-escalating move. And then, yeah, it w it's surprising actually, and that would yeah. mean that maybe that Blinken has been properly reprimanded or brought to heel or whatever. I don't know because he's been like he's been literally running around running the country. Like yeah. as far as I'm concerned, he's been like you know he's been running the, running the show for a while now since uh, yeah. certainly since Biden was sidelined. Well, it's funny you brought up the restructuring of Ukraine's sovereign debt because we actually had a, a guy who runs a credit fund. Mm -hmm. on the show a couple of weeks ago and he brought that up when they were doing the restructuring um towards the end of august beginning of september said their yield mm -hmm. was trading at like 18 percent mm -hmm. and i asked the question somewhat naively like wouldn't they want the war to stop if you're buying if you're restructuring this debt and buying this the, these bonds wouldn't you want the war to stop so you have like economic growth you're building from zero and you can actually uh, build right. an economy that would pay that back right and the answer and his answer was he didn't have like, he's, I think, yeah, that would make sense, but like, who knows what's going to actually happen. Right. It's a, what should happen is not what is happening. And what is yeah. happening is that, that the, it's not about Ukraine. Like they know they need, they need rushes. There's a couple of things. They want Ukraine's physical assets. They want the oil and gas under the sea of A's off. Um, and the Lindsay Eastern Black Sea. Trillions yeah. of dollars. Trillions of dollars. They want the coal, the lithium, all the rest of it, right? The steel, like they want all of that stuff. Um, Ten trillion dollars, they say. They think of you know of assets in that, that area of Ukraine alone, and the U wants that um, to happen as well because the EU wants to bring Ukraine in, but they can't bring Ukraine in with just the farmland because then. The European farmers would be would be uncompetitive. If you watch the uh, the, the the prank phone call between, with Bovin and Alexis and uh, Radislaw Sikorsky, the former Polish foreign uh, minister, who's by the way a, a, a complete and utter British asset. Period. Like period. Paragraph. End of story. The guy was the guy was educated in the UK. He speaks with a freaking British. He speaks, he's a Polish, but he speaks with a British accent for Christ's sake. Like you listen to him, but he's like, Oh my God, you are such a British asset. He's the guy who tweeted. Thank you, USA for blowing up the North stream pipeline. So he got caught in one of these prank phone calls with Vovin and Alexis and gave the whole thing away. You know, said, look, we're, we're you know, we want to, you guys are not going to become part of, uh, of the EU until uh, we can figure out a way to bring you in such that, you know, the European farmers won't be pissed off with you because you will outcompete all of our farmers. So by extension, if you can bring Ukraine in and, you know, create a European oil and gas sector, for example, and blah, 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 if you can move the money in there, then we can have a, you know, we can balance this out. Right. That was one. The other thing he said, which was very, very interesting. He said, you're not going to see Polish troops in Ukraine unless there's a ceasefire. And then we can be brought in. Then then they can be brought in as peacekeeping troops, which, of course, is, you know, the, the, that's the standard plan. Hey, let's hey, let's call let's call a truce and then, you know, gear up for round two of the war. Putin, of course, understands this and is not going to give them anything. As a matter of fact, what he's doing now is he's now finally letting his military like really make some some serious gains in the Donbass. Like it's very clear now he's going for, he's taking uh, very specific strategically important targets for the first time since practically since um, uh, Bakhmut. So uh, it's, there's no, there's no, um, no coincidence here that they're making moves on, they're making serious moves on Chasov Yar and uh, Volda, Voldahar, I think is the way you pronounce that, that one city and a couple others. And th this is what, this is, you know they're attacking the, the 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 Donbass front from six different directions, uh, while the Ukrainians have pushed all their their best troops into the Kursk incursion, um, and these 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 people still think that all we have to do is embarrass Putin enough, and the hardliners will overthrow him. And now I'm not going to disagree with that at a fundamental level. There is a portion of that that's true. The question then you have to ask yourself is. Is Putin that precariously placed at the top of the Kremlin today? I don't think so. So while I while I 
you know, and, and I'm and I'm I'm saying that knowing full well that the person who's been promulgating this idea is Martin Armstrong, who you know has serious like on the ground intelligence in in that part of the world. So I I I can't you know I can't discount that strategy completely, right? I can't discount it completely. So, um, but it just doesn't doesn't ring true to me that Pe- Putin would be that that uh, vulnerable to this kind of thing. But that's also why you've seen the escalations to the point of hitting Russian ammo dumps and really trying to embarrass Putin at the same time as we're about, I, I think that the Q4 is a very important moment. Like they think the next week is going to be very important because it's the beginning of Q4 and it's where everybody's going to start reassessing their, um, their investment strategies going into the fall. You know, at the end of every quarter, there's never really much movement per se in the important markets because the two and twenty carrying interest guys want to, you know, want to book their profits for the quarter, and the banks are dressing their balance sheets, and the central banks are are doing their thing, and everybody's like trying to get through to the end of the quarter. And then once Q four starts, then that's why the first Monday in October is always the potential blow up phase because that's when everybody wakes up and goes, okay, now let's get real for twenty twenty five. What are we going to do? Right, we're getting set. Because Q4 trades differently than Q3 does, which trades differently than Q2 and Q1. And you have to kind of assess markets in that uh, in that way. And I think that's that's part of what's going on here. That and, of course, you know, American elections are in November of every every other year. So there's the proximity to American, you know, political shakeup along with everything else and potential for policy changes and whatnot. So, um, yeah, like there's a lot going on here. And it's all it's all kind of coming together around the same time period. Yeah. No, we definitely, I mean, in the venture world, we definitely see that, particularly with the larger institutions, pensions, endowments. It's like, all right, Q4, we're going to figure out our 2025 app allocation strategy and then come back to us right. beginning of the year. This episode was presented by River. River is the best, most secure place to buy Bitcoin in the United States. Go to river.com slash TFTC, set up an account today. You'll be able to DCA into Bitcoin without paying any fees. You'll be able to give people Bitcoin via River links. You'll be able to send and receive Bitcoin over the Lightning Network. And you'll be able to set limit orders. If you want to buy Bitcoin at a particular price below or above where it is now, you can set orders to buy Bitcoin when it hits that price. Go to river.com slash TFTC and set up your account today. This episode of TFTC was also brought to you by BitKey. BitKey is Bitcoin made easy to use and hard to lose. If you're a hardcore Bitcoiner out there with friends and family members who have not gotten their Bitcoin off exchanges because they're worried about the complexity of hardware wallets, seed phrase backups, this is why BitKey exists. BitKey is collaborative custody. You have a ergonomic hardware device with biometric confirmation. You have the BitKey app with a key in it and then block holds another key in the server. This doesn't come with any seed phrase backups that people have to secure. You have social backup. It's a beautiful solution. If you're worried about the people in your life that aren't as advanced as you in terms of Bitcoin hardware and being able to set that up and secure it, BitKey is a great first step. So tell them to get a BitKey. Go to BitKey.world. Use the code TFTC20 at checkout and they'll get 20% off their first BitKey. No, it's it's like bringing this back to like the assassination attempts. And that's the other weird thing, like, pulling Iran into this obviously in parallel Israel uh, the pager bomb thing was insane insane precedent in my mind to, to do that right. type of distributed oh, remote attack right. uh, their video of the Ayatollah uh, making like a mockery video of Palm Beach saying that we, we have you in our crosshairs <laughs> oh, and then God. that's a that's the thing like if that is like not only a diversion, but they're trying to blame it in Iran. But like Trump seems to be embracing mm. it. Do you think Trump is aware mm. of these plays and he's sort of playing along with it to, for gotcha? Or do you think he's somewhat blissfully unaware of? No, I think he knows exactly what's going on. And mm. uh, I just don't think he cares at this point. He's like, well, if they're going to take a shot at me. They're going to, I mean, they already shot him once, right? So once you get, once you make your peace with, I, I would imagine. I mean, I've never been in a situation that's been that sincere. Like, I've never been shot, right? But you know, once you've once you've committed yourself to a particular course of action, right? You're pot committed in poker speak. 
And you go, yeah, all right, I've, 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 I've you know, I've accepted the risk of this, and you know, I, I can. The closest thing I can come to in my professional life is that moment when the FBI showed up in my door and asked, wanted to ask me about my relationship with strategic culture, and I had to make a make a decision about what it is I'm going to, how I'm going to, you know, go forward here. Am I going to go forward with, you know, go, you know, going to confront evil and. You know, never give in to evil and oh, go ever thou forth more boldly against it. And, you know, quoting uh, Mises, or am I going to shrink and, you know, go do something else with my life? And I chose the, for the former. And, you know, you get, once you hit that moment, like, you know, okay. Like, it was funny, the, the, this afternoon, uh, Nora Bin Laden um, was tweeting back to somebody she you know, either was on his show or something like that. And she's like, uh, lovely to have talked with you. You're now part of my gulag club along with Richard Poe and myself and a couple other people. And I just responded to her. I'm holding out for Guantanamo war. Nor I'm not, I'm, I, <laughs> like, that's, that's right. If they're going to take me and they're going to send me somewhere, send me to Guantanamo. Like that's, you know, I'm holding out for the, for the, for the, for the best of the bunch. I'm not, you know, I'll accept no substitute. Put me in the um, tropics. If you're going to put me somewhere. Yeah, exactly. I, you know, whatever. If you're in, you know, if I'm gonna get, if they're gonna waterboard me, at least you know, do it where you know, just like do the thing, like you know, like don't be pussies about it. And I mean, so I, you know, I, I don't know. That's I, I'm just, I'm just kind of vamping here when I say something like that. I don't, you know, but it, it is something that you think about. And so, I can see Trump just going, look, I'm pot committed to this. You know, I know what these, what these people want to do, and I know what they're doing to me, and I don't care. And that's that. And I'm still going to be Donald Trump. And okay. I mean, what else has he got to do? I mean, he's 78 years old. This is now his legacy. Like, this is his legacy. Not the buildings, not the business, not the... He made the per, made the point of this, you know, he made a turn at some point in the past. Like Trump, don't like Trump. Think he's the right person. Don't think he's the right person. Over it. Don't want to see the sec second season of the Trump show. I don't care. Whatever. Certain point, you have to look. He made a decision on this, and this is his legacy. And the interesting part about it, on the other side of it, is his counterpart, Joe Biden, who everybody's now forgotten about. <laughs> Comple completely memory old. Nobody. Right. Right. But let's talk about the discordant moment when Joe Biden grabs a MAGA hat off of a kid and puts it on his head and then carries it on the, as he goes up the stairs to the plane. He didn't like, they, no one like came in and took that away from him and said, no, you can't have that Joe. He's like, no, 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 this is mine. Like, like they took Joe Biden's $300 million war chest. Okay. They're fucking with his, the sentencing of Hunter Biden. And they're using it to keep Joe under control because he can't pardon Hunter until after Hunter's been sentenced. So they move the sentencing to after the election. They'll keep stringing him along. And Joe's like, you stole my money. I, and the Pentagon has now basically told him, look, we're done with Ukraine. I don't care. Like, you know, the, the British may want to get us involved in the war, but we're not fighting this war on their on their behalf. It's over, Joe. So if you believe, so with all of this and the coup story and the this, that, and everything else, if you string all of those pieces together, did Joe Biden make a deal with Trump to stay out of jail, to this, that, and to, to get all this stuff done that the Democrats won't give, won't give him? Because they, at this point, I'm having a hard time even believing that anybody can even credibly put together a plan or a narrative that Kamala Harris is competitive in this election. Well, she's not. No, well, that's what I wanted to get to. Part of like, or the poll, but before we get to that, okay, like, right. Playing like pulling on that thread that you're just pulling on and extending it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And if we're going to go with that, sure. that theory, like Jill Biden sitting at the the head of the table and, and running the first, well, whatever it was, committee meeting in over a year, I believe. It's just mm -hmm. like an overt, like, we're going to make a mockery right. of this whole situation and make it obvious right. to the people. That right, 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 right. Yeah, confident. that's a good way to read that. That's a yeah. good, that, well, uh, that Jill Biden is running a cabinet. Did we lose him? But I just, it's just like, I'm, I was talking and then it said, thank you. I'm like, what? <laughs> like, uh, let's, um, 
So, but I didn't do anything. Um, okay, I, I'm sorry. Was I about to say something rude? Like, I don't know. I, no, so I, I, but normally, I, of course, I do say something rude. That's like my shtick. Um, but no, the Jill Biden, the Jill Biden running the cabinet meeting was hilarious. When you from you just, I think the way you just described it was the right one, which is that the whole Biden crime family. Think of the Bidens as one of the mafia crime families uh, that run America. And Joe has his ego and he has his legacy that he wants and blah, 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 blah. And this is how he was going to get paid. And then they put him aside and stole his money. And now they're holding his quote unquote legacy over his head. And Ukraine was to be his legacy to continue into the future. I hope I'm not, I'm not gone. You're okay. Good. Uh, okay. Um, that was supposed to be his legacy and for his family and that they were going to be able to, you know, you know, pull their, their vague off the world for the next two generations or whatever. That's the whole, the whole shtick of being in Congress was for 60 years was that. And this is, you know, this was the, the gold watch and the whole thing. And they took it all away from him. Now a guy like Joe Biden, it's not like he's like, you know, we, we want to make fun of him now because he's been decompensating and he's sporifying as a mushroom in the white house and all this other stuff. Joe Biden is a fucking prick, dude. He always has been. And, you know, he's uh, he's a nasty piece of work. And he's angry. And he still has three or four hours worth of lucidity a day. And he knows exactly what's been done to him. So I have no problem believing that at that moment, you know, in this, in this moment, if he's looking at the polling and they're like they're sitting around looking at it going, she doesn't have a hoot in hell of fucking winning. If I want to get out of this with anything intact, if I want to get out with if I want to get out of this with my ass and my children's asses somewhat intact and get some of the money that was promised to me, I gotta to go to the other crime boss or the incoming crime boss, and that would be Donald Trump. And that makes sense to me. It seems far fetched, it seems weird. I'm not saying it happened, but it makes sense. Hence the whole MAGA hat thing and, you know, and, and putting all that together. So, uh, you know, go with it. I don't know. Plausible. We'll yeah, I think definitely, it's plausible. Definitely it's plausible. Least, it's at least fun. I mean, we, like, we just talk about it. We don't always have to like be right about this shit, but we, you know, we should be entertaining about it. Let's, let's entertain that idea and then see if it, and then see if it comes true. Right. Well, yeah. And, and going to like Kamala, like that's another big question i wanted to ask you mm -hmm. like the polls are i mean we, we knew they've been fake in the past particularly in the 2016 election um mm -hmm. the polls leading up to the election and that result proved that the polling was way off and this right. seems even more far like in 2016 it wasn't even far-fetched it was a bit surprising that trump won mm -hmm. because people mm -hmm. were still riding nate silver and um whatever the company he, I forget what it was, something 456 or whatever. 538. 538. Mm -hmm. 538. And the, his polling was gospel and, and Trump right. inevitably won, unless you were on 4chan, that was extremely surprising to you. And mm -hmm. it wasn't surprising around, to though, me at all. It doesn't seem like, it, it seems completely off kilter, uh, the, the yeah. polling. Yeah, and, and it you is. See, you see Kamala... Going to campaign rallies and doing very few press conferences, but when she does, she uh, she inevitably winds up putting her foot in her mouth or sounding a complete idiot. The whole thing with Oprah and the celebrities, mm -hmm. I think that came off completely disingenuous and um, terrible. The debate even, everybody was saying that she won the night of, but um, if you actually the listen to it, didn't watch it, and I could, like she didn't have any substance. She hasn't this whole time. All right. And the polls moved against her. I just I, I watched a couple of good videos and watched a, and, and some good uh, uh, read a couple of good articles on the polling. I'm uh, that she's polling far behind in all the battleground states where even Hillary was in 2016 or where Biden was in 2020. Um, and you know, in every one of those the battleground states, she's lost ground since the debate. Every one of them, like four points, five points. Like, I think Virginia's in play. I think that with some of the, the, the latest court rulings 
that will tighten up certain battleground states. I, I think, you know, it's going to be harder for them to cheat. And then remember, in the national polling, she has to be three to four points ahead of Donald Trump in national polling in order to have a prayer of winning. Democrats need at least three and a half to four points in the national uh, average to win, to be winning, because they're behind in so many of the battleground states otherwise, because they have such a massive advantage in places like you know, New York and California and others. And that's the mar- in effect, that's the margin of cheating. And so, like, when I'm looking at the map at this point, um, I was doing a 270 to win the other day or yesterday. I think I was doing one of those, was, like, filling it in. And I it, I think Trump's going to take two of three in, you know, Wamipa, you know, Wisconsin, Michigan, Pennsylvania. He could possibly take Virginia. Uh, and if he takes Virginia – Forget it. They, if she, he takes Virginia, she doesn't have a path to victory. Just take everything else. She's not going to carry all those other battleground states. She's not going to carry Georgia. She's not going to carry Arizona. She's probably not going to carry Pennsylvania. She might, but they would have to do epic levels of cheating that will be, uh, that will be easily uncovered this time. So what I would say is, I think they're preparing. This is what I think is more sinister than that. I think they're preparing for Trump to win, but that, but for them, they're going to try and queer the election results in certain states to decertify or <laughs> and, and, and make sure that certain states can't be certified to ensure that those people can't go to the Electoral College. But that doesn't even make any sense because then it goes to the House and Trump wins 38 to 12 because each state gets one vote. It's not a, it's not a, it's not a, you know, it's not a, a roll call vote in the House of Representatives. It's, it's a state by state caucus vote. And in that thing, I think the, the Democrats only win like 15 states maximum. Like the, the he wins 35, 15, like it, 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 the, 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 there's mechanisms for this. So many people don't, under, don't forget the, what the mechanisms actually are, what the law actually is. They're going to try and tell us what the law is. That's going to come from people not within the United States, is going to come from the British and Davos and all the other people who are going to queer the friggin', you know, they're going to push election mechanism nonsense at us to gaslight us about how, you know, this is going to be Trump stealing the election. I'm like, no, that's not the way this works. We have mechanisms for this. It's in the Constitution. Read the fucking thing and get over yourself. Like, so that, that's what I think they're going to try and do. They're not going to accept the results of the election. They're going to try and decertify certain states or, you know, or poison the election results to the point where we can't get a we can't get a clear victory and uh, tie it up in the courts. And then, you know, and then I don't know. I don't know what happens after that. I, like, like we start lobbing nuclear weapons and then we declare martial law and we, we put the election on the back burner. Like you think that's you don't think that's beyond these people. Like, no. are you kidding me? I mean, it would be. Beautifully poetic, if that's actually what happened, considering <laughs> what happened in 2020. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I, I'm becoming more convinced. Like, how much of the calculus that the strategist on the Democratic side are running right now, like, she is so unlikable. And so, mm-hmm. <laughs> like, uh, it, it seems crazy to me that anybody can listen to what she says and think this is a viable candidate to be chairman in chief of the United States. Uh, the United States, right? Exactly. Yeah. It's uh, um, how like, about this one, Mark? Like, are they prepping God. to hand him a bag of shit from the financial economic side? Oh, yeah, of, know, course, of course, of course. Like the, what they're doing, that's, that's part of what we're seeing right now with all these escalations. Yeah. They're trying to leave. Obama left him with a lot of poison pills in 2016. He, but they only had two months to prepare because they were expecting to win on election night. This time, I think they, once he survived Butler, Pennsylvania, they, now they're like, oh, we've got seven, we got six months. How, what are we going to do to destroy, to, to destroy his presidency this time? Because now he's wise to our game about running, running roughshod around him in the administrative state. We've got Chevron has been, been destroyed. The Jarkissi destroyed, um, the, the 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 star chamber courts of the of the alphabet agencies like those two rulings alone 
put us in a you know put us in a completely different world legally, right? So they can't you know run the same game that they ran the last time, which is you know remember it's the cabinet secretary that actually runs the United States. Executive orders are not orders; they are requests by the president to the cabinet secretary to implement these things. If the cabinet secretary doesn't want to implement those things, guess what? Doesn't get implemented. Now, the president can fire the cabinet secretary and put somebody else in place. And during Trump's presidency, first presidency, he was not in a position. I don't think he was in a position to really be able to do that. One, no one wanted to work for him because the, the guy, the, the, the whole thing was a shit show. If he comes in this time with a plan with real people to, to and a plan, a staffing plan that makes sense, and he's got people loyal to him, and he's got other people um, and very and powerful people is what I'm getting at, uh, you know, pulling in his direction. And this is where I would, again, I would listen carefully to Jamie Dimon saying, you know, we should really listen to these MAGA people. They're not crazy. They should be respected. And all my really liberal friends in New York have got it all wrong. He just said this the other day, like the fucking Jamie Dimon, like, this is important, folks. Like this, this dude's not on board with another four years of fucking Obama. Okay, he's done. And I go back to Davos 2023 and Davos 2024, where the guy he, where he shows up two times in a, in a row. He wrote, he shows up with a bag of poo in his hand and like drops it on the t- you know, drops it in the middle of the room, lights it on fire, and then steps on it. Like in Davos, told them all, hey, we're going to drill a lot more oil and expect 7% interest rates. Like, <laughs> like, fuck your climate change. Like, are you kidding me? Like, this is the, this is the head of the most powerful bank in the freaking world. And he's telling you he's not down with the great reset. Because what's the great reset? It's the great banking reset. It's the, it's the great banking reset where the central banks take over the world. And cut the commercial banks out, out of the out of everything. Right? And that ties into the stuff that you and I that we were talking about right before we hit record. I was reading your article about uh, Silicon Valley and Signature Bank and your discussion with Caitlin Long, which now that you've done that one, I need to sit down and I gotta call Caitlin up and have her on my, back on my podcast again so we can do this again. Um about you know how the banks were solvent, and yet Elizabeth Warren and company went after them because they are hostile to Bitcoin. They're hostile to you know digital assets that are not central bank digital currencies. Um, so like you, there's a picture here. It's a it's 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 a very clear picture, and all you got to do is like embrace it and go. Oh, that's what's happening. So yeah, now it's a very interesting moment in time. Like the, the, this is a different world. And I think if Wall Street is on board with a second uh, season of the Trump show, which I think they are, and I think Powell set the table for Trump to come in, you know, in, a, in the best situation that he can under these circumstances, um, then, you know, we get past the turmoil of the election. And as long as we avoid you know, antagonizing Putin and or Iran to the point where we have a massive shooting war that everybody has to respond to, then we could get out of this period in history with just a bunch of border skirmishes and some nasty financial warfare, which would be the best outcome for humanity. It's not a good outcome in the short term. A lot of people are going to die. A lot of people are going to lose their, 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 their assets. It's going to be liquidations and it's going to be terrible and it's going to be but it but the alternative is the complete and utter burning down of the first world and then the quote unquote build back better fuck you you can't you guys can't you guys can't even like guys can't even run a conference well and you think you're going to run the world like fuck you like it's just so it's so comical right that so you can feel the uh, the tide changing too. See, I'm not. I'm sure you saw, but the optics of Tim Waltz meeting with Alex Soros in a penthouse in New York, man of the people. Yeah, man of the people. Man of the people meeting, going yeah. to kiss the the Soros ring in Central Park penthouse. Uh, 
Like, but did you see the video of him changing the air filter on his old pickup oh truck? Oh, gosh. Yeah. Like, oh, are you kidding me? He didn't even me? change it. He just took it out and put it back in. I know. Like, it's ridiculous. Like, like are you kidding me? I, I did that shit when I was 17 with my dad. There, no one changes their air filter. And by the way, no one changes their – no one. and Tim Waltz does not own a 1970s freaking Ford pickup truck. Like, <laughs> this, this like, um, no. And then, and moreover, he's not like he's not, you know, turning a wrench on it and you know playing grease monkey either. Like he's not doing that. Like, oh my god. Well, you, they're they're completely out of touch when it comes to optics. It's like whether it's that, and then the momentum is shifting against them. Like you have Javier Malay, Nayib Bukele, going to the UN this week and just completely decimating right. like global socialism, globalist agenda. Right. Right. Malay. I'm. Not, I'm. By the way, I'm still. I'm still not um, sold on Mille. Um This whole him him sending all the all of Argentina with gold back to the yeah, Bank of England. Idea. That not a good idea. Like, dude, that's not a good idea. And so I. I. I Bukele, I. I. I still have a. I have all a soft spot for. Um, and you probably know follow him far closer than I do. Um, but Millet, this seems again another one of those straight out of central casting. He just mm-hmm. seems too good to be true, and I just Came don't trust out of him. As far as me, yeah, I, don't, I don't trust him. And yeah. he's cartoonish. Like, dude, you don't have to be a cartoonish freaking Austrian economist. Like, you just don't. Like, and so that to me screams like, you know, it's like the he's as cartoonish as the freaking neo Nazi guys surround that came out during like the Spencer, I mean, like the Richard Spencers American and those friend. guys and. Yeah, and the TRS group from, you know, if you go back to 2016, the Mikey Knock and all those fucking guys, they were all fucking feds. Every goddamn one of them, you know, like, <laughs> give me a break. I, I'm so over it. It's like, it's, it's like, I'm done. Like, you know, and like, you, you, you go watch the, the, the Patriot front guys and they're all feds wearing high and tight, with high and tights, wearing the same outfits with the same military watches, you know, and the walkie talkies that you can't, but they, they can't even like, like, they can't even hide the walkie talkies. Like, dude, come on. We can see you. You know? Like, oh my God. <laughs> like, well, like, like it feel you know? it feels like they're losing again, they're losing on optics and their message just isn't landing. Like climate change, no. fifteen no. minute cities, whatever maybe everybody's like, all right, I've had enough. This, we're not going this direction. But like bringing it back yeah. to the newsletter I wrote and the conversation I had with Caitlin and right. Jamie Dimon's posturing like I could see like if we have an intercabal squabble within the U.S. federal government regulatory agencies mm-hmm. where you have Warren and crew really trying to push this Davos agenda CBDCs all of that like this may be where they really dropped the ball and fucked up massively is with what happened what I wrote about what Caitlin and I talked about which is by targeting banks that were servicing Bitcoin companies particularly Silvergate and Signature Mm-hmm. It essentially incited the bank runs that happened last year and created that banking crisis right. in March of last year. And mm-hmm. again, just pulling on the thread that you put out there and running with the idea that Jamie Dimon is sort of fading that part of the intercabal squabble. Like mm-hmm. he'd be like, you, you literally <laughs> incited a banking crisis, even though he did benefit massively. JP Morgan of absorbed one of the banks. Their, right. Their, right. their market cap went up $15 billion. Mm-hmm. But it, it, maybe that was just like a, a positive externality of a crisis that he believed could have uh, could have had severe negative externalities. Um, mm-hmm. It was all because they were targeting these banks, like we said, Silvergate. That's what was. That's why I had Caitlin on because um, Elaine Heatrick from Silvergate, the chief administrative officer, published an affidavit uh, as part of their bankruptcy filings and proceedings basically said we had we were, our hand was forced we had the money to give back to our depositors if anybody came to our window and said hey we need our dollars back we had the dollars we were giving them back and essentially the fed whether it was jerome powell the federal reserve directly or one of their federal reserve bank branches um said hey uh we're going to need you to uh, reduce your exposure to bitcoin and crypto related businesses to 15 percent of your book and at mm-hmm. that point hundred percent of their book was Bitcoin and crypto related right. businesses. And, so, right. and they're like, nobody knows the exact timeline they gave them, but 
right. everybody's running with the assumption it was like you got to do this in a month or two and they're like we can't right. do it so we'll just give everybody their money back and right well it's interesting a panic right Right, and that created the panic and the bubble, and then you know, and the history happens, right? No, and I was just thinking about that, and I was thinking about the conversations that I've had with Caitlin because we've been trying to square, you know, the arguments that I've been making about what the Fed is trying to do with what's happened to her with Custodia Bank, and it's been a real, it's been a real conundrum, and I've, and I've, I've, we've had multiple conversations on this, and I, you know, and I have to, and it's been hard for me to to make a make heads or tails of it. What I can say is the following. The uh, no argument that the Fed is not. I think if the Fed is in, is is okay with Bitcoin having a certain role, it's not. It's in having it. it, it they, they're okay with it having a certain role as long as they have, you know, their ring. It's ring fenced in a particular area of the market that serves their interests, right? That I can. Or that I can make. Uh, I can. What sort of looking for that? That I can see, right? Um, I can also see that there are plenty of big players on Wall Street that want in on the crypto banking game as well, and they want that business, and they don't want that business in upstart banks. They want it in banks. They want that business, so they would be happy to piggyback on Elizabeth Warren being, you know, doing her Davos thing. And then them benefiting from it by absorbing the book of business, i.e. Silvergate Bank, um, and all the rest of it. And then if they have competing technologies to, you know, Tether or to some other stable coin. And then there's the other side of it, which I still think my, my angle on it has a role to play as well, which is that don't just look at um, the fact that those banks were solvent. I think that's fine. I have no problem believing that Silvergate and, and, and Signature were on the up and up But in that respect. But at the same time, we also know that F- FTX was a freaking money laundering scheme for evil Davos money to destroy our fucking political system. Like this is a, it's that, it's that argument that I've been making for a long time, that the money goes out, gets lifted up at 0% through the euro dollar markets, and then comes right back into the United States to destroy us culturally and economically and illegally and everything else with our money that they levered up. And then, you know, and then they create a bunch of Ponzi schemes to pay everybody to go run around in black block and burn down Minneapolis. Like this is like, it's reality folks. This is what they've been doing. And the fact that, and, the timing on FTX is, I still go back to the timing on them to going, taking out FTX was on election night, 2022. Like literally the next morning, oh, the red wave didn't happen. Yeah, and we, and we executed this, this, this Democrat bank, this Democrat you know, money laundering operation, crypto operation the next morning. As far as I'm concerned, like that had to be the Federal Reserve. Right. If you believe that, you know, and and it still fits that like Powell and company and Wall Street are trying to they responding to the greater, greater global macro picture that the world is moving back towards mercantilism. It's moving away from globalism to a re-regional to a regional currency block world. And when you have the world's reserve asset and trade settlement, dominant trade settlement currency and all of this, how are you going to do that? And not cause massive dislocations. Well, you have to start the process of changing the flow of ca- of dollars around the world. The first thing you've got to do is start draining the offshore dollar markets, which is what we've been doing for three years. At the same time, you have to then start cutting off all of these um, af- uh, avenues of massive leverage within this, those systems. And so you go after the euro dollar markets, it's easy. You raise interest rates to 5% and all of a sudden, you know, they can't infinitely rehypothecate dollars through the shadow banking system. But part of the shadow banking system was created, you know, part of the shadow banking system today involves crypto. So that has to be executed as well. Okay. It's not that crypto is a bad thing. It's that that version of crypto, that era of crypto had to be destroyed if their goal is to get control of U.S. monetary policy and make it work for the United States as opposed to the world. And so it's just, in a sense, these banks kind of got caught in the crossfire or kind of caught in a a drive-by shooting 
uh, between, you know, bigger players. I, and that may be the, the way, you know, that's the way I, I, I read it. And then, and as I, as I said to, to Caitlin, I'm like, you know, I, I'm hoping one day that you and the, and, and the fed can come to an arrangement when the time is when, from their perspective, it is going to happen for them, but it's going to happen when the time is right for everybody to allow that to happen. And that's the frustrating part for her. And, and that's just, I think that's just reality. She's trying to do it right. Of course. And I, you know, and I applaud her effort. I, you know, I, I want to see Caitlin succeed. I want to see custodia bank. Succeed. I want to see all these people like removed from, from power. Um, but you know, then there's, there's reality and reality is sometimes, well, sometimes reality is a harsh mistress. So, yeah, no, a couple of things here. It was interesting after that, affidavit was published i believe it was thursday or friday of last week over the weekend uh headlines started popping up like oh we're gonna let uh we're gonna not have to force through the sab 121 bill and we're gonna maybe test things out with bny mellon first we'll let them custody bitcoin um on behalf of their clients and so it was like bny oh, it's a bank in new york mellon huh oh you mean davos yeah. bank yeah uh, yeah davos, so that, davos central on wall street yeah great yeah. so that headline came out and then um you have what's going on this week and that's like you know the other thing with custodia that's where i think the fed could be messing up um mm -hmm. yeah. so custodia trying to get their master account they're corresponding with the federal reserve bank of kansas city um for some mm -hmm. reason I, maybe it's the closest in proximity I think it to is. To where they're domiciled in um wyoming, wyoming. Mm -hmm. and maybe what they have to do is interact with that bank but it is. They wrote an amicus brief in July of this year. And this is where the Fed could really mess up because the amicus brief was written by a really good constitutional lawyer. It basically highlights that the Federal Reserve Bank of Kansas City is extrajudicially undermining um, state law, and particularly the mm. dual banking system where you have state chartered banks and the Federal Reserve yes. System and constitutionally you're supposed to have competition between those two. And yes. if you're going to unilaterally deny a state chartered bank, a master account, you have to have power from the executive branch. And since the federal reserve bank um, branches, their boards and their presidents are appointed via the board, which is owned by the um, privately held commercial banks. Like they may be, Break, like breaking constitutional law because they don't have yeah, yeah. a mandate to actually uh, unilaterally uh, arbitrarily decide that somebody, a state charter bank can't, can't get um, mm -hmm. uh, a master account. And so that like, cause that's what Austrians yeah, no. gold bugs have been saying for years is like, most people don't know the federal reserve is a private entity and this right, right, right. attack on custodia may be the lifting of the veil for the general public of, they're, yeah, yeah, private yeah, entity the last, yeah no, you're, you're right. And it's funny because Caitlin and I discussed the beginnings of that when it had, that, that had just come down. The last time she was on the podcast, she didn't have very much time to talk. So we only were able to talk for about half an hour because um, she had other things going on in her personal life and, and sad. And I have to get back to her and find out. We, have, we need to have part two of that conversation. But that's exactly the point she made up, made when she was on, when, when she and I talked a couple of months ago. Thank you for reminding me of that because I, you know, like so much stuff goes through my head on a daily basis. I can never keep can, can never remember it all. Um, but that is a very important point, and it's and that may wind up being custodia's like big contribution to the world. Yeah, they may never get their master account, but they may like finally put some controls on the Federal Reserve System, which would be phenomenal. And think you know, then we we talk about the um, the the article that Ellen Brown just put out about um, state the state banks coming back and that the state of florida is now considering creating a state bank in order to uh, uh, combat debanking of individuals and companies that run afoul of dei and sg and uh again this is another this is the why of having a guy like ron DeSantis as your governor who's a former judge advocate general and you know an excellent lawyer um as your governor is a good thing, right? Because Ron is very sharp. And so Ron knows exactly what he's doing. He's also a very sharp politician. So I give him, he's a terrible campaigner, but he's, he's excellent in every other way. He's a tremendous, tremendous freaking administrator. 
He's done such good work for the state of Florida. It's not funny. So, you know, you know, sorry, conservative treehouse crowd, free republic crowd, but you know, DeSantis is not a moron. Sorry. Um, and by the way, he's on the Trump team. It's just that's just the truth. So, you know, the um, when you put it all together, like that's a big deal. Like if Florida goes through with their with a state bank, and there's like 17 other ba- states that are doing this. We have this the state bank of North Dakota is very successful. So, you know, here we go. Let's get let's get down to it. And now, you know, what's interesting about this, Marty, I, when I first because this is now a, it literally just pops into my head right now as we were talking about this, putting this all together. When I first theorized about what the potential for SOFR was, when I went back and thought about all this stuff back in 2021, and I was like having my great, you know, kind of Sherlock Holmes moment and all that just it was all just kind of happening and all just kind of like laid out in front of me. I'm like, oh. That could be cool. One of the subplots, one of the things that popped into my head was that SOFR would, could um, catalyze, was the right word for this, catalyze going back to the original conception of what the Federal Reserve was supposed to be, which was a reserve bank, or 12 reserve banks, regional banks, with regional interest rates, and regional liquidity and blah, 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 to help keep the banking system, you know, in effect, liquid, but regional and competitive so that the Kansas City Fed sets a different rate from the San Francisco Fed, from the New York Fed, and then wherever you have, you know, um, you have competition for capital based on regional interest rates. Well, I was and I, I even asked Daniel DiMartino Boot this when I had her on the podcast. I said, "Could SOFR lead to the re-regionalization of the Fed funds rate? Meaning, we just do away; it just replaces the Fed funds rate, and then everybody trades relative to a you know a, a, a premium or discount to SOFR on a regional basis." And she's like, "Well, yeah, but they'll never give up that power." I'm like, "Well, obviously they're not going to give it up willingly, yeah, duh." But she's like, "But yeah, that's possible, like, you know." Um, so now start interfacing that with this move towards state banks start thinking in terms of what how the fed might have fucked up badly in how they've handled custodia and the fact that that may what be what powell is actually trying to accomplish here is martin armstrong has made the point many many times he's like and i, and I don't as a doc as an austrian and as a as a free money guy free and a free banking guy i don't i don't agree with this tag Okay, but Martin has made the argument and that we can go back to the original conception of the Federal Reserve. That will, and I will, I will agree with him there that that would be far preferable to what we have today, right? That a one size fits all interest rate for the country is dumb. It advantages certain geographic parts of the United States at the expense of others, right? So. It, it's it's allowing, for example, there's high demand for capital and the, the capital in California, and you have a monolithic Fed funds rate. That means that relative to the demand for capital, um, businesses in California are getting it cheap, and Missis and Mississippi, for example, is getting stymied. Like Mississippi needs three percent, California needs six percent. We don't have that. We have four and a half percent. And guess what? California is is is. Uh, is stimulated by a point and a half and Mississippi is repressed by a point and a half. Well, it's no different than what's been going on in the European Union. Germany has, I, I, you know, I thought about this, and Germany has used the, uh, the ECB's target rate at, and the euro as a means by which to run an internal mercantilist uh, campaign against its own member states. And this is how they've been draining capital towards in, 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 the, in the European Union, how they've been training capital towards the European Commission and towards Germany, and then reinforcing their power and destroying the peripheral states like Greece and Portugal and, and everybody else. And now they've turned their eye, of course, to Italy. Well, that's kind of what we're dealing with here with the, the Fed funds raised on the exact same thing. So getting back to a regional quote for interest rates in the United States would set the the Fed back towards its original conception, which is better than the the institution that we have today. It wouldn't be perfect, but never let the perfect be the enemy of the good. 
quote Murray, Murray Rothbard here. And like these things. And so I think all of these things are like, you know, kind of in play. Right. And we're seeing the, the markets and then uh, in the various states uh, react to that. Now we're seeing, you know, market pr- forces are having, you know, the states like want to start chartering their own banks. Yay. This is a good thing. This is a win. Right. It's not perfect, but it's the right. It's it's an it's an it's a re it's a return to federalism. Right. And it's a first step towards, you know, real decentralization. Uh, and so we've and so at the same. So you have that happening within the U.S. But what it's what are you seeing from Davos and company? They want a they want to take the net these national systems and make them global. We're going to have like one interest rate policy for the entire fucking world under the auspice of the IMF and, and or the BIS. And that's what they, that's what they're going for. And that's what they're arguing for. And so those people are monstrous and they need to be stopped. And, you know, I firmly think that that's in accordance with the, uh, with the needs and the wants and desires of the people on wall street. And, and uh, at, the certain, at a certain point, the Fed's going to have to get up some power, whether they like it or not. Yeah, and I, I've brought this up many times, like thinking of the path of least resistance. You give yourself up to that monster or concede that maybe you're over your skis in many different regards. And what is, like you said, what is don't let perfect be the enemy of good? What's better given the choices? Like right. Americans have proven throughout a couple of centuries, almost three centuries that were pretty willing and able to figure shit out on ourselves, decentralized decentralization works. Federalism works. Mm-hmm. It got us to this mm-hmm. point. Um, mm-hmm. uh, at least up to, uh, ele- <laughs> up, to, up until the early 1900s. And mm-hmm. it was pretty good right up until then. Right. And I, it was. I, uh, this is a very optimistic, like white pill too. It's like, maybe they're both systems in some regards, uh, one to a larger extent than the other are collapsing in of themselves and, I guess that's the the two different tactics that Davos versus the, the Western federalist system are taking. Davos mm-hmm. is going to double down on incompetency and trying to force everybody a square a square yeah. um, square peg into a round hole. And here it's like, all right, we ran this for for long enough. Let's just, like let's let the market figure it out. Right. Well, and and again, this is again where. Bitcoin absolutely has a role play, and so does gold. And we may need both of them in different in different corners of the market to do what needs to be done. The bricks are going to use gold, okay? They're not going to use Bitcoin. Um, they're going to use gold, and they they understand gold. They're going to use gold. They're not. I don't think they're hostile to Bitcoin, but for right now, gold is going to be the gig. And for us, we have gold. We're going to wind up having to deploy our gold. I'm, I'm dead serious. Like we're going to deploy our gold at some point um, if we survive this. And if we don't, then the United States will break up and uh, Davos will win a round in that, you know, they'll, they'll target the, the breakup of the U S in such a way that the bond market, because that's always the target here. The, the U S bond market is the target folks. It's like, let's not kid ourselves. Um, and uh, you know, some of it, some of us, some of our capital and some of our, our ingenuity and, you know, our, our, our capital will, uh, will escape their rule for now, but they'll think that, well, we're bigger now than we were before. So that we'll just squash those people later. And it's the way they they think of Russia. It's the way they think of Iran. It's the way they think of China and all of this stuff. Well, the truth of the matter is, is that they're spending a lot of their seed corn right now just to maintain the position that they have. And, they're very good at fronting inevitability and fronting that they're winning because they, because they know that if they show weakness at all, the whole thing collapses like a house of cards very quickly because, you know, that's just the nature of, because I mean, we eventually we'll have a bank run on Davos as confidence in its ability to project power collapses. No, I think it's happening. The year. Yeah. I know it's happening. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. I mean, you compound COVID, which many people thought was a speed run to mm-hmm. try to force things and take yep. the foot off the pedal for a bit. But now, like the immigration crisis, particularly, it's like way, mm. 
like people are they're eating the cats they're eating the dogs they're eating people's pets like the memes are great many people want to believe that is a uh, fake news but most competent americans that don't yeah. uh don't lie to themselves and believe their lying eyes can see like no right. this seems to be happening and you have like pete Buttigieg coming out yesterday crime rates are down everybody's like that's bullshit like right like every every like every speed like they're accelerating at a pace that's very obvious uh, it's not like the frog boiling a water it's like the right. water's already boiling and they're trying to throw us all in it at once right like, well this is uh you guys are speed running this which signals that they're desperate and, uh, scared to an extent oh they're very scared I, I i haven't seen that this level of scared for quite a long time um if ever in my life actually and um that's not do you bring up pete buddha judge or my next right at least at all butt giggler um i can't like that guy is he's a butt giggler as far as i'm concerned now and uh, I, I, I love i love dexter he just makes me laugh dude um and uh and he came out and says, what a shock. We passed the Inflation Reduction Act and inflation was reduced. Like, oh, fuck off. Like, you know, like he's getting ratioed like to hell and back again on that for that one. Like, oh, my God, you are so unbelievably unqualified for the job you currently hold. It's not even funny. Um, yeah, they're not even good yeah. propagandists. No, it's really they're really bad at it. Like we're better propagandists for their stuff than they are. Like we can write sarcastic memes about their shit that is better than the shit they put out. The shit they yeah. put out is just so freaking bad. We just laugh at it. Like, it reminds me, like, it's funny. It reminds me of when I was a kid we were ta- and we were, we were being told about the Soviet Union. And uh, I think I remember if we had a Russian foreign exchange student in my high school or not. It was something like this. But I remember hearing stories about this, like, you know, at the end, you know, there's all these propaganda signs all over, you know, Moscow and St. Petersburg and whatnot about, you know, all this stuff. And we just we just looked up at the stuff and we just laughed. We didn't believe any of it. It was all nonsense. And it's that, you know, it's like they, you know, we pretend to work and they pretend to pay us. Like, you know, um, that's the way things are. And that's I think we're we've reached that level of 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 uh, of, of, of I don't know, crazy, to be honest with you. So and they've they're. I, I've said this before too. I just remind you, like these are like the grandchildren of wealth, right? The grandfather makes the wealth, the son maintains the wealth, and the grandchild spends it all on hookers and blow. And that's the people who are running the show right now, and they're fronting because they've been taught how to present themselves in public as you know wise and insouciant and up within and above it all but they're not did you see christine lagarde on the daily show for fuck's sake <laughs> i missed that I saw some tweets about it but don't well aside from the fact that it was nauseating i can only watch five minutes of it um it was clearly a moment of them of that's panic you put christine lagarde on the daily show with mr dnc mouthpiece himself john fucking stewart that's them trying to sell her as a better as a more personable, you know, oligarch than and Jerome same week, Powell. Same week, they did the same thing with Trudeau on Stephen Colbert, didn't they? Uh, right, they did, didn't they? Yeah, 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 yeah. Same thing. So when you see, good point. So when you see a cluster of those things, that's them trying to sell the whole group. Trudeau's going to lose. Lagarde is going to be torn to pieces by the market. And by the Federal Reserve, she's being torn apart by the, by the market. Like, dude, they cut fifty basis points right, on Wednesday, and we're still getting the bear steep in her trade in the U.S. bond market. Okay, I, 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 I was, I was hoping they would only go twenty-five because I wanted to see this very trade happen, and I needed Powell. I thought we needed to have Powell disappoint the markets in order to get that. No, no, but he gave the market everything that they said they wanted. And it still is selling off. That's got Lagarde and Yellen. Well, let's just say, yeah, uh, yeah, they're, they're they're they don't know what to do. They don't have any well, they don't have any other options at this point. But to keep buying Treasuries into a into a bear market and they're going to get fucking crushed. Yeah. It's well, let's dive into this a little further because you I want to say you glossed over it earlier, but you mentioned it earlier, like Powell with the fifty bit 
rate cut setting Trump up for success if and when he gets elected. Because that, like, I, I don't know if you know, I was in New York last week when Trump made this pit stop at the uh, dive bar mm. in the West Village to buy some burgers and Diet Cokes with Bitcoin. And uh, right. that was the that was the first, it was Fed cut day. And that was the first question the, uh, the, the press pin asked him. And his mm. response was one of two ways. Powell's either making a political move to help out the incumbent administration or the economy is very bad. Right. And and I I think um, it's the latter. And I'll be honest with you. I think Don's interpret. I think that that's the false dichotomy. Because cutting in September doesn't help the incumbent at all. If anything, history of the stock market, for example, tells you, and Daniel DiMartino Booth has been banging her shoe on the table at cruise ship about this, that cutting rates is the signal that there's a top happening in, in equities, that equities roll over six to eight weeks later when everybody realizes, no, the economy is shit and, you know, and this, these valuations are insane. Now we have this, we have the same, we have the competing problem of well, what happens, what does that mean for the rest of the world? And what if we have a sovereign debt crisis unfold in Europe? Well, we're still going to get capital flowing into the United States. So we can have a very weird moment where the Dow goes up, continues to go up, grind higher. Um, but, you know, well, it just could be a flight to the equities should just be going to being a flight to quality as we have an, an, an impending sovereign debt crisis in the short term. But I still think that it's setting up for like the possibility of, you know, a liquidity crisis somewhere within six to eight weeks, which would be the election night. You know, those last couple of days before the election where they, you know, all of a sudden, even the boomers like retirement funds like blow up. Um, that's not going to be good for Kamala Harris. That's going to that's going to be for Trump. But it's also the 50 basis point cut does help. Set up, you know, us coming out the other side of that liquidity crisis, if it's not centered in our markets, which I don't think it will be. I think it's going to be centered overseas. If I'm wrong about that, I'm wrong about that. But I don't, I just don't, I don't when I, how I'm watching credit spreads and, and, uh, and currency rates and whatnot. I was on with um, Tracy Shukart and uh, Lynn Alden this morning on a Twitter space. I hadn't met either of them before, so it was great to, to finally get a chance to interact with both of them. It was a, we, had, I think we had a really good time, actually. Um, and Lynn and I were coming to the same conclusions about the world from completely different perspectives. Um, then I was trying to, you know, explain what I thought was happening and, and, and credit spreads and like, no, there's something happening here. Like the UK guilt market is, is in trouble. The Lagarde is sitting on the German tenure in a way that is kind of scary. I've not, I've seen her intervene in the German tenure before, but you know, she's now sitting on it at 2.2% as opposed to 2.6%. Like how did that change by 40 basis points? Was it because the now the yen is 144 and not 162? I mean, what's going on here? Like, so Powell's cutting rates, and you know, at some point everybody's going to finally just wake up and go, like, dude, are you kidding me? Like, Volkswagen is going to cut 30,000 jobs in Germany, the biggest employer in Germany. This is after BASF like, already moved out. Yeah. And you know, and they're all going to move their they're all going to move their plants to the United States unless you can get Kamala Harris to come in and destroy the the ta- quote unquote the tax haven status of the United States, which is what Davos has been trying to do through the Biden administration all for the last four fucking years. And well, it's it, 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 you know, or and I mean, and Obama before that, and blah 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 blah. Whereas Trump is like, oh, no, no, we're going to open this stuff up. We're going to bring the capital here. We're going to build stuff, and we're going to have chips, and it's going to be great. And he's not wrong. I, I, I know exactly what he's going to do, but what they have to do at the same time, and Powell's been very clear about this, and I think Powell's rebukes of the government, of the Biden administration, by a Fed chair coming out and saying, look, we can only do so much. The rest of it is now up the fiscal side of things. And if the, you know, the, the Congress has to get the fiscal house in order, we can only do so much over here. You can't ask us to do any more. That's not our job. So... Like that's unprecedented. 
to have a Fed chairman say that. And then he didn't say it once. He said it like a dozen times, like every time he's asked about this stuff and he gets, you know, some dumb, you know, 30 something from, you know, the New York Times asking him some idiotic question. He's like, you know, OK, that's not my that, I, I can't do anything about this. It's like I can only do what I can do. It's still up, it's up to Congress to deal with the uh, with the, the servicing of the debt. And yeah. so and if there's if there's a weakness in a lot of uh, of commentary from very good people, people I respect tremendously, um, but their blind spot is this idea that because things have always been this way, they will always be that way in the future. That's a very that's that's a kind of Malthusian style argument, right? Um, and they don't. They don't and they don't fully apply the law of diminishing marginal of the, the law of diminishing marginal utility, where at some point uh, that's the, the, the return on that at that that activity is no longer necessary it is no longer you know worth the worth pursuing. Right. It's the juice isn't worth the squeeze at that point. So we're going to start we're going to you know, take that capital and do something else. With it. We're going to take we're going to shelve that behavior and do something else. Well, in this case, it's going to be deficit spending like at some point. You know, you've run out of balance sheet room. The Fed can't expand their balance sheet anymore. Blah, 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 blah. Like, we can't do this. The debt GDP ratio is too much. We're service, the debt servicing costs are too high. What are we going to do about it? Well, how about we cut spending? Well, we can't do that. Well, yeah, you can. You got a trillion. Are you spending a trillion dollars overseas every year? Are you? Hey, how about we get rid of that? That? You got, you got Trump on the campaign trail saying we're going we're gonna, to uh, gut the Department of Education. <laughs> we're going to shut yeah. it down. Sure. Right. I mean, there's, uh, there's many, well, there's, uh, well, I mean, but I'm even, I mean, I'm even like what I'm saying and the way I, and, and what I'm, ar- what I'm actually arguing for wh- how people should communicate this is to say, look, yeah, that's great. I, I think the Department of Education is dumb. I think there's like a whole bunch of domestic spending that we do that's dumb and wasteful. But the counter argument to cutting spending is then GDP would contract and then unemployment will rise and then this and then this and then this and this. And this. Fine. You're right. We won't cut that first. We're going to cut all the overseas spending. We're going to take away Samantha Power's budget over at USAID so that she can't foment color wars, color revolutions anymore. We're going to get we're going to close some of the fucking bases overseas. We're going to bring that money home. We're not going to spend it out there. That won't that's money we spend out there that has not a dime that does that doesn't really flow through the American economy. So maybe 10 percent of it. Is you know the SGNA on that is seven percent. So we cut a tr- we spend a trillion dollars overseas. And we spend seventy billion dollars in domestic spending to to manage that trillion dollars worth of spending. SGNA costs us seven percent. That seems about seems decent. Okay. Well, how about we cut that out and then we and then we can deal with the seventy billion dollars worth of SGNA spending in the form of unemployment and retraining and everything else and finding these, these people jobs domestically. If we're not spending a trillion dollars overseas, there's going to be a trillion dollars worth of investment within the U.S. for them to, those people to go get repurposed and find jobs in the private sector in the real world. Like, this is, we don't even have to hurt domestic GDP. Gross GDP will drop, but domestic economic activity and real, and real economic activity won't change a, at all. That's my argument. Like if you and I don't see how you can even argue with that point. Like, let's just start there. You're coming off as a very strong American first guy right now. You got to be careful. Okay. I'm sorry. I I, I believe that the Constitution, as flawed as it is, is still the best foundational fucking document in the world. Oh, by the way. And I happen to think that we have the best freaking corporate law in the world. Oh, by the way. And the best legal system when it actually is functions the way it's written. Oh, by the way. So fuck all these other people. Yeah. I want to see America go. I want to see that structure handed to the rest of the world like it was supposed to. And we didn't do that. Yeah. No, and it's, uh, I brought up, the, look, you can bring up the chart again, but it's funny, the connecting dots, like having this conversation mm. with you two days after talking with Caitlin, connecting dots here, top left, executive branch, architects of Choke Point 2.0, Barat, mm. Rem and Murdy. Like he was one of the key figureheads that targeted the banks. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And now he's Kamala's lead economic advisor is going on CNBC and pushing for unrealized tax, uh, unrealized gains taxes and oh that economic policy that would destroy the tax haven that you described a bit earlier. It, it would destroy everything about capital handling within the United States. That chart is uh, that, that that slide is outstanding. Gensler is another one 
Oh, I remember all the Bitcoiners, like oh, the bad Bitcoiners, frankly, saying, oh, Gary Gensler is going to be a chairman of the SEC. It's going to be great. He's a pro-Bitcoin guy. He taught a Bitcoin class at MIT. Like, he hates Bitcoin. This guy exudes everything. I, I, I'm like, are you kidding me? He hates Bitcoin. This is going to be, this is going to be a, another, it's going to be four years worth of him, you know, um, sand in the gears, monkey wrenching, you know, pro- proper uh, 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 crypto asset regulation. And he's finally getting excoriated for it on Capitol Hill. It's a good thing. It is a good thing. Mm-hmm. Gary Gensler can go pound sand. He can go pound a lot of a lot, something other than sand, to be honest, as far as I'm concerned. But, you know, it's starting to get late, Marty. I'm going to start getting really salty soon. So we may, we may want to wrap this up so I don't say things that are really bad. Um, no, I don't mind really bad things, but I agree. I've got a I'm going to jump here soon too, but no, thank you for coming back on short notice because I wanted to follow up with the assassination attempts, but I think the economic stuff particularly is interesting heading into this, all the chess pieces being moved on the board. And I think it's another reason why I love the conversations with you because it emboldens my confidence because every once in a while when you're not having conversations like this and the news cycle hits you, you're like, maybe, maybe they are like making progress. And it's like, no, it's all Mm. projection. Like they're Mm. trying to project strength that has no foundation. And it has, I mean, they have a lot of power still and they're they're going to use every ounce of it. And I hope that, you know, this is the final point on the way out the door. Like I hope that um, I hope the hell I'm wrong that they're not blackmailing us with a nuclear war. Like, I'm that serious. Like, like we could wake up tomorrow and be in a different world. Every day, we all wake up thing and thinking it's going to be, you know, we all, the way I ended this morning is that we, we just had a, a, an hour-long discussion about one sigma events, like that things are going to move one standard deviation away from where they currently are. And, you know, gradually this thing, stuff will move this way and that way. I'm like, let's hope we don't wake up in a three or four sigma world tomorrow because that's, that is, that's a one sigma probability at this point. <laughs> we have a yeah. one sigma probability of a four to six of a three to six sigma you know, catastrophic event, which throws all of this out the window. And you know, smoke them if you got them, folks. Like you know, I, I don't know what to tell you at this point. Like, I I, I don't have enough. So I don't have enough you know sardines and didn't freeze dried meat like for that scenario. So, you know. Yeah, and but as I we'll said, do our best. many times throughout our many conversations. Like that's why yeah. being able to do this is important and i do think compared to any other point in history the means of communication that exists today is extremely powerful and being utilized pretty well by the people fighting a good fight on what i deem to be the the right side of this battle that we have the spiritual battle if you will yeah it is a spiritual battle it's an ideological one and it's also a um uh uh, and and then it becomes a pragmatic one very very quickly and that's the other thing we have to like remind ourselves of, and and we have to keep the 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 the, the, the that spiritual and ideological desire and and um, and our philosophical cores, you know, keep them, hold on to them, like cherish them, but realize that you also have to interact with a practical world where everybody has competing. There's so many competing incentives that you have to figure out ways of of just be careful about the way I'm going to put it is this. No one is any one thing at any one time, right? People in pivotal positions can be both, can be at the, simultaneously, or to quote Tom Stopper, consecutively and concurrently, hero, victim, and villain, right? The three sides of all character. Um, you know, and depending on how you view, how, how you look, when you look at a, a figure, for example, like Jerome Powell or Janet Yellen or whomever, you can see them, you, you have to see them from all sides. And I hate to even like do that for Janet Yellen because I think she's the villain. But, you know, look at a guy like Powell, who's a very pivotal figure, I think, in history. Look at a guy like Trump. Look at, you know, look at some of these, 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 these people who are confounding in their, um, in who, in, they're the fulcra on which all of this will turn and they're going to have competing in, they're going to have competing roles that they're going to be want to be cast in and we have to be willing to view them from different positions from those three perspectives even though we know in the like the grand scheme of things in our philosophical hearts they're one role they're a villain or they're the hero or they're the or they're the victim 
But a guy like Powell is all three all the time. You can't be Fed chair and not be all of those things. Um, so that's the way I would, that's what I would argue uh, people for uh, to, to do a little bit more of. And if we do that, I think all of our commentary gets better. Um, yeah. It's what I try to do as, as, as best I can here and there. So, um, and I fail, uh, you know, all the time, but I do my best to, to, to do that. And if I can do that, and it, it usually yields the best insights. It's like, well, let's just reframe that person and think of it from their perspective. Now what? Hmm. Oh, that's interesting. You know what I mean? Yeah. Well, I think you do an incredible job of it. And it certainly opened up my mind and changed my perspective on many things. And I appreciate these conversations more than you know. And I appreciate you doing this late on a Wednesday night. Uh, it was a fun one. I like the uh, the night riffs with you, Tom. Cool. Well, maybe we'll do it. Maybe we'll just do it and uh, do the evening thing again. That's fine with me. I'm okay with that. So I, I adore these two, Marty. I have a great time doing them and it's always good to catch up. So let's do it again, you know, in six, eight weeks and we'll see where we are. Yeah. Stay safe in the storm yeah. there. I will. And uh, until next time, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Peace and love, freaks. Take care.